So great to be here with you today. So great to come in late at night in absolute darkness, not be able to see where I was or the beauty that surrounded me, and to wake up to one of the most glorious days I've ever had on this planet in my 46 years of existence. This is an extraordinarily beautiful part of the country. I bring you greetings, saludos from El Paso, Texas, my hometown, especially to the three people who speak Spanish in the back. Gracias. I live in, Amy and I are raising our kids in one half of the largest binational community in the Western Hemisphere. Three million speaking two languages from two countries, two cultures, two histories, joined to form one people, not divided by, not separated by the Rio Grande River, but brought together in the Chihuahuan Desert at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, this beautiful community in its own right. Now, we're in the desert, so we're unfamiliar with all this green stuff that you all call trees and grass, but um, just, just an amazing, captivating place. In El Paso, Texas, our hometown, where we're raising Ulysses, who's 12, Molly, who's 10, Henry, who's 8 years old, happens to be one of the safest cities in the United States of America. For the last 20 years, it's been either the safest, the second safest, the third safest, one of the safest cities in the United States, pre-wall and post-wall. And our safety, our safety is there not in spite of the fact that we are a city of immigrants, where more than a quarter of those with whom we live were born in another country, if you think about it, they chose us. They left their comfort, their language, their home, their family, everything they knew to become strangers in a strange land, to be here to get ahead for their kids for sure. But they also came, they also came here because they were called to us by this experiment, this idea of America and to contribute to our success. So we are safe in El Paso. We are safe in our communities, not in spite of the presence of immigrants, I would argue because of their presence. So this country that is comprised of so many from so many different places, when, when, you're, when you're looking at your family tree, you might be able to trace it back in America 10,000 years. You may be able to trace it back 300 years. Perhaps your ancestors were brought here in bondage and literally built this country, built the wealth that so many enjoy, and the descendants of those who built that wealth disproportionately are unable to enjoy. You may have come here and your, and your ancestors as an asylum seeker, as a refugee, as an immigrant, called to economic opportunity, wanting to join your family, fleeing persecution. Let's keep that in mind when we honor the words of my former colleague, John Lewis, who said, we all came here to this country in a different ship, but today we're in the same boat. When we think about those, when we think about those who are fleeing some of the deadliest places on the planet, in Guatemala, in Honduras, in El Salvador, countries that can no longer guarantee their protection or the lives of their kids, you begin to understand what would compel you to scoop up your baby and walk 2,000 miles, maybe hop aboard on top of the roof of a train known as the Beast or La Bestia to show up here penniless, without a friend, no idea what is next. And then imagine at that most desperate and vulnerable moment the United States government, which if we are still a democracy, and the government is the people, and the people are the government, that is all of us, we take that child for whom you risked your very life from your arms, we deport you back to the very country from which you fled, we put that child in a cage, we separate you with no hope or prospect of ever being able to join again. Tantamount to torture, a cruelty that we try to avert our eyes from, 
turn our backs on, or lay the blame at one person or one party. As long as these conditions persist, as long as we do these kinds of things to our fellow human beings, it is on all of us. But here's the upside. In this democracy, if we can fix it, we can make it work, if it reflects our values, who we are, the reality in our lives, on the ground, and in our communities, not only can we ensure that every single one of those separated families is reunited, we can rewrite our immigration laws in our own image, in the image of our communities, free more than one million dreamers from any fear of deportation from the United States. <laughs> Allow people to come out of the shadows, get right with the law, and contribute to their maximum potential, not just for the betterment of their lives and the lives of their families, but to the betterment of this country. If the challenge is immigration, if the challenge is an economy that works too well for too few and not well enough for too many. I think of school teachers and educators who are working two and three jobs just to make ends meet. <laughs> Though we've asked them and they've answered the call on the most important job, unlocking that lifelong love of learning that is inherent to every single one of us as a human being. We need to make sure that they and everyone who works in this country is able to earn and expect a living wage. Again, not just good for those families, good for us and good for our economy. One of the most famous progressives in a more than a century of progressive politics in this country, though he was a Republican, Teddy Roosevelt, said that you're not going to have something like political democracy. Where, where all of us count, all of our voices are heard, uh, all of our votes go towards the candidate of our choice, the policies that will benefit us, that reflect our perspective and our experiences. You will not get political democracy until you have something approaching economic democracy in this country. Right now, not too, not too unlike TR's time, you have an extraordinary concentration of wealth and power and privilege. One of the most recent and damning expressions of this is that we have fellow Americans who have an extra three or four million dollars <throat> which they can use to game the college admissions process, to ask kids to take tests for their kids, to bribe coaches to uh, falsify um, their athletic performance, and there are families of kids who can't put together three or four hundred dollars to be able to go to this university as a down payment on the tuition, which I understand annually after financial aid has kicked in is around $29,000 per student. When we do not allow access to opportunity again, not only is that bad for the families who cannot avail themselves of these opportunities, it's a drag on our entire economy. It's not allowing America to realize its full potential. When you have millions of Americans who cannot see a doctor, cannot afford their prescriptions, even when they have insurance and the copay has kicked in, who cannot take their child to a therapist so that she's well enough to learn that next day of first grade, not only have we failed one another, not only is that unconscionable, it's the most expensive way that we have devised to fail one another, to fail to recognize the potential of all of us. When that young man that I met in Laredo, Texas, who said, Beto, when you're talking about guaranteed, high quality, universal health care, resonates with me because I've seen a doctor once in my life. And that doctor told me, not only do I have diabetes, not only do I have glaucoma, neither of which I can afford to treat, by the way, but if this current trajectory persists, I will be dead before I'm the age of 40. Now just think about that. In the year 2019, in the wealthiest, the most powerful, the most medically and technologically advanced country that humankind has ever known, we're going to allow this guy to die of diabetes. We're going to allow our fellow Americans to die of the flu. They're going to die of curable cancers. And not only 
Will that weigh on our conscience? But it's going to be extraordinarily expensive. As that young man gets closer to year 40, to his death, he will be going to the emergency room. He will be asking for our help. The cost to care for him will be astronomical, and he will be in no way prepared to bear that cost. But you will, through your premiums that will continue to climb, you will, through the taxes that you pay, and we all will, in the lost productivity, those things that he will not be alive to do. That job that he works, the taxes that he pays, that poem that he writes, that punk rock band that he starts and tours the country in. Whether it is measured economically, artistically, aesthetically, or in the family that he might be able to raise if he was just alive in order to do it, we all lose out when we fail to make these investments. And when I think about the most existential challenge of them all, the fact that the conclusion is clear, there's no longer the shadow of a doubt that this climate is warming, that it is produced by... It is produced by our emissions, our excesses, and our inaction. Warmed one degree Celsius just since 1980 over pre-industrial revolution levels. And if it warms another degree Celsius going forward, we are screwed. And that is the term the scientists use. <laughs> what that means is the climate change we are already experiencing today unprecedented wildfires in California and other parts of the world. 58 inches of rain fell from the sky in my home state of Houston, Texas in 2017. It is the landfall record for as long as we have been keeping them in North America. And it also happened to be the third 500-year flood in just the last five years. The droughts that our farmers are undergoing who grow our food and the fiber that feeds and clothes us. Those scientists say they're connected to climate change and they will become more severe and more frequent and more profound. They will undermine our ability to even live in some of the communities that we call home today. The war in Syria produced after the longest drought that country had seen. People fleeing the countryside, coming into the cities. Whether it's war or migration, or the very lives that we purport to care about. All of that is jeopardized unless we take action. And the scientists also tell us, and this is the best of the good news that we can expect, there are 12 years left to us to take bold, decisive action together. If we harness the political will of more than 320 million people, if we harness a more conscientious capitalism that brings ingenuity and innovation and entrepreneurship to bear on this problem as well, if we reassert, if, if we reassert, will you hold that for me? If we reassert our global leadership, and think about this, think about all the men who stormed those beaches in Normandy on D-Day, all those women and men who are serving overseas right now, their lives literally on the line in wars that we've been fighting for nearing 19 years in Afghanistan, nearing 28 years in Iraq. Think of the freedoms that we have purchased. Our position on the world stage that has come at the sacrifice of so many hundreds of thousands of American lives. The fact that we used to be known as the indispensable nation. And right now, we are the only country that has absolved itself of its responsibility to work with the rest of the world in the Paris Climate Accords. <laughs> Though this administration and this president has dug us an awful hole, it also presents perhaps our greatest moment of opportunity and promise to reassert global leadership, because even if we all band together in the face of this threat and this challenge, it will not be enough. It's going to take the world. And there is one country whose people can help to establish that leadership. It will have to be by example and by service and sacrifice in this country to begin with. But it will also be a convening of the nations of this planet around the threat that could extinguish ultimately human life on this planet. Now listen, all of this, 
that I talk about and everything that we could do to meet it is premised on the greatest single mechanism that humankind has ever invented to call forth the genius and the ingenuity, the resolve and the power of a people. And that is our democracy. And our democracy right now, our democracy right now is as broken as it has been in our lifetimes. It is captured, it is corrupted, it is being attacked from without, it is being attacked from within. We have to make sure that corporations who've been equated with people, money which is equal to speech and Citizens United that allows corporations to spend unlimited amounts of money in our elections and their ability to purchase legislation and the policies that follow, that allows, that allows the opioid epidemic that we see raging across this country. We are 4% of the globe's population. We are 85% of the globe's consumption of opioids. That didn't just happen. We didn't just choose that. Corporations, big pharma, corporations like Purdue, which marketed opioids to prescribers and doctors as non-addictive miracle painkillers. Most of those who are getting arrested for purchasing fentanyl and heroin on the streets started with a legal prescription of an opioid, even though those executives in those companies knew the addictive properties of what they were selling. And yet, none of them have done any time behind bars. None of them. None of them have truly accounted for the veteran that I met at a town hall meeting like this in El Paso who stood up and said that when he came back from war with PTSD, perhaps with traumatic brain injury, and was prescribed legally an opioid by his doctor in the VA. And when that prescription was cut off and he had no alternative therapy and he was hooked, he was now buying heroin on the street. And he admitted it in front of every single one in that room, his fellow citizens. He was desperate and he needed help. He is not a criminal. He should not go to jail. We should treat him with compassion and care, get him back on his feet. And we should acknowledge the gross injustice in our criminal justice system. While those pharmaceutical executives get off scot-free, we are arresting people in this country for possession of marijuana, a substance that is legal in more than half the states in the union. And you know what? <laughs> marijuana use is relatively the same amongst Americans of all races and ethnicities and backgrounds and walks of life. But you also know what? That disproportionately it is African Americans who are arrested for possession of this substance. <laughs> who will do time behind bars, who upon release will be forced to check a box on any employment application form that says that they have a conviction making it less likely that they get the job, who will be unable to attend Penn State because by law they no longer qualify for federally backed student loans or scholarships or grants. Narrowed opportunity, constrained choices and options, that is our criminal justice system today. If we hope, if we hope to overcome any of these challenges that I just described and those that you will raise when you raise your hand, then we've got to get our democracy working. That is why in this campaign, we do not accept a single dime of political action committee money from anybody. No contributions from lobbyists, and we campaign everywhere. Everyone is important. Wherever you are, whoever you voted for last time for president, I shared with my friends in the other room, no me importa, I do not care. All that matters now is that we are Americans, we are human beings, and we have the opportunity to meet the greatest challenge of this country's history. That's why I'm running to represent you, to serve you, to work with you as the next president of the United States of America.
So thank you. Test, test. Thank you for having us out. Thank you for having us out. Thank you for the very warm welcome to the Happy Valley. Thank you, uh, especially, especially to Katie Rose, um, who was um, the first person to welcome us to describe the rich heritage and history, to make sure that I took a picture next to the lion before I left. And, and a big thanks to, to whoever's holding the El Paso flag up there in the back. Thank you, man. So we're, we're going to try an experiment in democracy. I'm going to hand the microphone over to you. Uh, if you all could work together to... Sorry, I'm not going to do that. Um, I was told we only had one microphone, but it turns out we have two. So Cynthia Cano, um, who is our, our everything on the road, uh, along with... with Chris Evans, she's going to take the microphone to you wherever you are. I'm going to try to get the most, um, the most into this conversation that we can. Yes. Hi. Um, so there's a lot of uh, really qualified female candidates running this year as well. Uh, what will you do to empower women in Congress? A hundred percent agreed. Count myself lucky to be in this field. Remind myself constantly that come summer of 2020, we are all going to be on the same team behind the same nominee. And whoever she or he happens to be, we want them to be successful in the November election against Donald Trump. And we want them... And we want them to be even more successful as the next president of the United States of America. So this campaign cannot be about tearing people down denigrating our opponents, vilifying other people within our democracy. It's got to be about lifting people up, expecting the best out of them, and making sure that at the end of the day, we are all on the same team. So you asked about my campaign specifically. We have so many women who are leaders in our campaign. My last campaign for Senate in Texas, run by Jody Casey, an outstanding leader in my hometown of El Paso. Um, much of the leadership in this campaign from women. And I've got to tell you, whoever the next president is, their administration must reflect the true genius and diversity of experience and talent and expertise in this country. Every single position of public trust and power will benefit from that kind of pursuit of talent. So you've got my commitment on that, and you've got my commitment to support whoever the nominee is with everything that I've got. So thank you, appreciate that. Okay, down the yeah, middle, I'm over here, down the middle, got it right here. Go ahead. Hi, Congressman. Uh, I was a big supporter of your Senate campaign, and uh, I think the success of it was really based on the ground game, knocking on doors and everything. So I'm just wondering how you're planning on um, translating that energy across the entire country, not just Texas. Thank you. And I, I would assume by the, the Beto for Senate shirt that you were a supporter of ours. So thank you. Thank you for sending that support to Texas from Pennsylvania. Served six years in the House, every single day of it in the minority. The only way to deliver for those veterans uh, whom I served on the House Veterans Affairs Committee, for those active duty service members whom I served on the House Armed Services Committee, for my 750,000 constituents in El Paso, Texas, was to reach across, walk across the aisle, and find that Republican partner in the majority <clears throat> with whom we could get it passed. So expanding mental health care access for veterans, we did that with Republicans. Expanding protected public lands in Texas, a state not known for it, we did it with Republicans. Improving border security and the flow of people and trade at our ports of entry, making us more secure and creating more jobs, did it with the Republicans. So when I campaigned for Senate <clears throat> in a state that was for so long, too long, written off as too red to even compete in, we didn't write anybody off, and we didn't take anyone for granted. We went to not the reddest county in Texas, but I believe the reddest county in the United States of America, King County, voted for Donald Trump 96% in the 2016 election. But you would agree with me that regardless of who they voted for and regardless of who they were going to vote for in the race in which we were running, 
They were deserving of our respect, of being heard, of being represented, of being fought for. So we showed up everywhere. Went to 254 counties of the 254 counties in Texas. And I'll tell you what, not only did it get us closer than any Democrat has come in decades, 2.6% if you're counting, but it also allowed us to transcend some obstacles and barriers that have been put in our place, in our state. We ranked 50th in voter turnout before 2018. We don't love our democracy any less than you do in Pennsylvania, but we were drawn that way. Some people, by the very fact of their race or their country of national origin, were drawn out of congressional districts. They call it packing and cracking. Therefore, drawn out of a reason to vote because some people's votes really did, in Texas, count for more than others, and I would say effectively drawn out of their democracy. So how do we transcend that? Well, obviously, we need a new Voting Rights Act. We need to end the racist voter ID laws that we have in Texas. You in Texas, you in Texas could use your permit to carry a firearm to prove who you are at the ballot box. You in Texas could not use your student ID at Texas Southern University to prove who you are at the ballot box. Who do you think Texas wants to vote in these elections? I want everyone to vote, whoever you are and for whomever you vote for. So though we lost, we saw voter turnout in Texas at levels that I have not seen in my lifetime, approaching presidential turnout levels. Young voter turnout up 500% from 2014. <laughs> Two, two new Democratic members of Congress elected from seats that were long thought to be safely Republican. And get this, in Harris County, home to Houston, Texas, the largest city in our state and the most diverse city in the United States of America, 17 African-American women won judicial positions, literally changing the face of criminal justice reform there. So... You're right. It is showing up everywhere, showing up for everyone, demonstrating a profound respect for those whose votes we are campaigning for and for whom we want to serve going forward. You, if you so choose, can be part of the largest grassroots effort this country has ever seen. We will put you to work. If you want that responsibility and the accountability that comes with it, if you want to meet your fellow Americans and bring them into this conversation and this election, then please sign up. You can go to BetoO'Rourke.com. We'd love to have you on the team. Thank you for the, for the question. All the way to the back. I'm all the way to the back of the room to your left. All the way to the back to your left. Got it. Hello. Hi, Beto. Uh, keep fighting the good fight and doing great so far. So my question is, you make a lot of important points with climate change, and AOC's offered a really bold plan with the Green New Deal. I guess, as president, would you adopt that policy at face value? And if not, what kind of modifications or changes would you make to it? Thanks. Yeah. So we mentioned the threat that we understand another degree Celsius, and, and we're cooked. As, as a planet. Uh, we mentioned the opportunity before us, 12 years within which to act. We fear the judgment of our kids and grandkids come year 2050 on planet Earth who will look back on us with extraordinary pride or will be wondering who were those pendejos back in 2019 and 2020 who squandered the best opportunity for planet Earth and humankind. Um, the only way to match that threat and that opportunity is with bold action. And I think AOC, um, the Sunrise Movement, um, young people, old people alike, who've come together and said that this country must act. And we must act in the boldest way possible. It must be government action. So making sure that we make the investments in renewable energy. We make the tough political choices to transition from greenhouse gas emitting energy sources and transfer to renewable energy. Texas might be part of the path. We generate more wind power in our state than does any other state in the Union. El Paso, my hometown, is building out utility-scale solar, rene renewable, uh, plentiful. And you know what? 
It's also tied to our economy. That's another thing I like about the Green New Deal. The two fastest growing jobs in the United States of America today are solar energy jobs and wind energy jobs. The other thing the Green New Deal does <laughs> is it acknowledges that those communities who have already borne the brunt of climate change and pollution and the spike in rates of asthma and cancers and MS near the big polluters typically are poorer communities and far too often communities of color. So let's make sure that as we make the investment in one another and in our communities, we also repair some of the damage done. We ensure that opportunity is equal for all. And we also, as I said this at the outset, we also harness the engine of a more conscientious capitalism, the power of the market to also make sure that we address these challenges. And then beyond the Green New Deal, that reassertion of global leadership, because as a farmer shared with me in West Burlington, Iowa, a few days ago, she may or may not believe in climate change, may or may not believe it requires this kind of bold action, but if it does, she does not want to bear the burden alone. She does not want this country to do so by itself. And the answer is, she's right. And even if we did everything we could, it would be not enough. China has four times the number of coal-fired plants than does the United States. As more people in the country of India are coming online to the electricity grid, as their rates of consumption um, get closer to ours, um, we're going to have real demands on our environment, on our ecosystems, and our ability to meet these projections. Last thing that I'll tell you, for those who have fear about going forward with proposals like this one, we have been able to demonstrate a decoupling in our economy between growth and job creation and reliance on fossil fuels. The two used to be parallel lines growing together. We have seen productivity and job growth and economic growth continue to climb for too few, but continue to climb overall in this country as we have seen the, the use of carbon-based energy begin to level off. It's a great way to think about this, not having to sacrifice jobs or the economy uh, or, or, or the ability to improve the way of life for our fellow Americans. So yes, Let's be bold, let's come together, let's get this done. If we don't, it'll be our kids and grandkids and the people of the future who bear the brunt of those consequences. Thanks for the question. In all the right, back. we're all the way to your left. To your left, all the way to your left. Here. That left. Oh, okay. In the wake of the media frenzy after Khashoggi's death and the lack of morals involved in the Saudi involvement in the Yemen civil war, causing arguably the greatest humanitarian crisis of our time, what is your plan for relations with the Saudis moving forward? I think the values of, of this country, premised on the idea that all of us are created equal, this, this extraordinary experiment in democracy, um, the premium placed on human rights, the human rights of every single human being, those cannot be values of convenience. Those must be absolute values for us. And so when, out of political or foreign policy or military convenience, we turn a blind eye to the murder of journalists, to a country that will not allow full civil and human rights for the women in that country, to a country that has produced so much fundamentalist terror that has found a home here in the United States. You can go back to the 9-11 attacks that is expressed throughout the Middle East and much of the rest of the world. A country, as you point out, that is responsible for the bombing of their neighbors in Yemen, indiscriminately hospitals and school children, millions of our fellow human beings on the brink of starvation in one of the most water-scarce countries on the planet. And to the spirit of your question, we are in part culpable. We are co-combatants at some level in that war. The military aid that we provide to Saudi Arabia, the weapon systems that we sell that may benefit our defense contractors but do not benefit the lives that are taken in Yemen. Yeah. 
We have to call that out. And we have to have friendships that are based on mutual values. It's the only way that the rest of the world is going to take us seriously. But then let me say this. So agree with you about Saudi Arabia. But, but also, if we begin to talk about other countries in other parts of the world, and we don't acknowledge what we are doing here in the United States, a prison system that is the largest on the planet, disproportionately comprised of people of color, if we don't face the truth of slavery and segregation and suppression of our fellow Americans, if we don't acknowledge that there is 10 times the wealth in white America than there is in black America today, or if you are a five-year-old student in a kindergarten classroom and you happen to be a student of color, you are four to five times more likely to be suspended and expelled, that we have a schoolhouse to jailhouse pipeline that begins not in high school, but begins in kindergarten in this country. We will not have the moral authority to talk to Saudi Arabia or anyone else until we get things right in our own house. So let's make sure that we focus here as well. Thank you for the question. Okay, right up front, right here in front of you, Beto, right in front, Hello. to your left, kind of, a little bit. There you go. ¿Qué tal, Beto? Mucho gusto. <laughs> es un placer estar aquí con, con ustedes. Gracias. Gracias. Um, so my question has to deal with campaign finance. Uh, you recently pulled in $6.1 million, if I occur... Uh, yeah, you, come on, give them a round of applause for that. It's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, you broke all records, which I guess is pretty good. But my uh, concern is how much of that is coming from a process which is called bundling. For those of you who don't know, bundling is a process in which... Um, uh, political activists and people in the private sector and lobbyists go to wealthy um, multimillionaires and billionaires and basically tell them to give the maximum, which is normally uh, anywhere from $2,700 to $5,600, and basically use it to sort of overinflate a campaigner's, um, you know, their first day totals. For example, just 1,000 people giving ping 5, 000, the maximum $5,600, that's $5.6 million right off the bat. Your campaign has not released the number of individual donors you have, nor has it released the um, average donation. Now, I'm not accusing you of that, but the fact that your campaign is currently working with notorious mega bundler Lewis Sussman gives me a bit of a clue. In addition, um, uh, when we look on your website, we don't really see anything in terms of a solid platform for policies. It's mostly just platitudes in a merch store. So I guess two-pronged question. One, are you going to... <laughs> Please, please allow, her, allow her to ask the question. Yeah. So two-pronged question, I guess. One, are you going to release the number of individual donors and their average donor donation? Because I know your campaign has that data. If it didn't, it would mean you'd be running a very incompetent campaign. And I don't think you are. You seem like you have your stuff together mostly. And two, when are we going to get an actual policy from you instead of just like platitudes and nice stories? Thank you. So the, the answer to your, thanks everybody. So, so the answer to your first question is yes. In, in addition to how much we raised, the fact that we raised it from all 50 states, the fact that we took not a dime from a single pack or lobbyist, we will, we will release the average and the number of donors. To your second question, to, to your second question about policy. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try to be as specific as I can. I, I mentioned our criminal justice system. I've called for the end of the prohibition on marijuana and the expungement of the arrest records of everyone who's been arrested for marijuana. I've been doing that for a long time. On the question of healthcare, we've talked about universal guaranteed high quality healthcare. You asked the path to get there. Two extraordinary women with whom I've served in Congress, Jan Schakowsky of Illinois, Rosa DeLauro of, New, of uh, Connecticut, have introduced a proposal called Medicare for America that ensures that if you have employer-based insurance, and you like it, you keep it. Your doctors, your network, what works for you right now. If you don't have insurance, or you don't like the insurance you already have, you enroll in Medicare. Costs a lot of money, it will be measured in the trillions of dollars. It is not inexpensive, but as I made the point, and I hope the case earlier, it's a, far, it's a lot less expensive 
than taking care of people at end of life who've never been treated in the first place. When it comes to public school education, paying teachers a living wage and starting Starting public education not in kindergarten at five years old, but in pre-k at four years old universally for every single Child in this country. I was asked about the Green New Deal I answered the question about the 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 Green New Deal when I talk about rural America I talk about an opioid crisis, which is disproportionately felt in rural America I talk about those whom we must hold accountable for the crisis and the way in which we must treat those who are enduring the crisis not through incarceration, but through compassion passion and treatment and care so that they can get back up on their feet. So in every single policy area, I'm trying to describe not just the goal and the aspiration, the, but the path that we will take to get there. I understand if we disagree or come to different conclusions. That's the genius of our democracy. I appreciate you being here and asking the questions. Thank you. All Gracias. right. We're going to be right up front in the middle. Gonna, I have to follow middle, Cynthia because right she has a microphone. Hi. Um, I'm curious, what can you do for the LGBTQ community, and why should we vote for you? As president, I would sign the Equality Act, which guarantees the full civil rights of every single American, regardless of their sexual orientation. As president, I will continue to listen to members of the LGBTQ community and be guided by them. Yesterday in Detroit, met a transgender woman who asked me what I was going to do about violence perpetrated against transgender women, specifically transgender women of color. And I asked her to, to inform me and guide me. And she said, it is sometimes days before law enforcement responds to the violence or deaths uh, perpetrated against transgender women women of color, not too unlike what I heard in Milwaukee the day before. The problem of human trafficking in that community, specifically women and girls of color, who when their parents report it to the police, the police sometimes wait days to respond, say, just wait and see if your daughter comes back. And then far too often, if she does, she is prosecuted as though she were the criminal and not the victim. In Texas, it is a defensible argument before a judge that someone of the same sex came on to you, and therefore you had to kill them. In Texas, there are 30,000 kids languishing in the foster care system. CPS, Child Protective Services, so under-resourced and understaffed that kids are sleeping atop and underneath the desks. And yet in Texas, by law, you can be too gay to adopt one of those kids. In Texas, it is legal, literally, to fire you based on your sexual orientation or refuse to hire you in the first place. And we are not alone. And so civil rights, or human rights, are a national and federal concern. And so we must have federal action. The Equality Act gets us a long way towards redressing this injustice and making sure that, again, we call forth the full potential and promise from every single person. But it also is a function of how we treat and talk about one another. A president who describes Mexican immigrants as rapists and criminals, Klansmen as very fine people, attempts to stop all Muslim travel to the United States of America, with the implication being that Muslims are dangerous, has had profound negative consequences on all of us. Hate crimes in this country have been up every single year for the last three years and counting. On the same day that President Trump signed the executive order attempting to ban Muslim travel to the United States, a mosque in Victoria, Texas was burned to the ground. Perhaps more profoundly devastating and damaging. When you listen to our children, third grade Mexican-American girl in El Paso asking, why does the president not like me? When I tell that story in Houston, Family says we have a third grade daughter as well. She came home from school the other day asking if we were in the right country because she's Muslim. Though she was born here and we were born here as well, though in my mind that doesn't matter, what is that going to do to her conception of herself, her value, her worth, where, what she can do in this country or whether she should be in this country? So making sure that we celebrate the talent, the vitality, the human life 
of every single one of our American, uh, fellow Americans has got to be the defining value of this country in law, in action, and in the words that we use. So thank you for asking the question. Okay. Slight right in the middle, and these are our last two questions right here. Okay. Hi. Uh, you had some really big ideas today uh, and really great ideas. However, your voting record doesn't quite reflect them. Uh, while you were in the House, you supported Trump and GOP attempts to loosen requirements in hiring Border Patrol agents, chip away at the Affordable Care Act, ban uh, kill a ban on oil drilling in parts of the Gulf of Mexico, lift a 40-year oil export ban, and also supported Republican legislation that protected utility companies that started wildfires. Uh, are these indicators of what you would do as the president? Thank you for the question and for the accountability. On the, the first issue of Border Patrol, um, what I sought to do with Republican colleagues was to speed the transition of returning service members to this country who want to be able to work in law enforcement. Um, going through the red tape and the bureaucracy to find function and purpose and a job after you've just put your life on the line for this country um, doesn't make any sense to me. I want to make sure that we get people in place into positions that are incredibly important. And so that was my reason for that. In terms of the Affordable Care Act, um, not exactly sure of, of the vote to which you refer, but I support the ACA. I want to expand the ACA. I live in a state that has suffered from a lack of expansion. Though the federal government offered 100 cents on the dollar for expansion of Medicaid, our state refused it. Millions of my fellow Texans are unable to see a doctor. The largest provider of mental health care services in my state is the county jail system. People are getting arrested on purpose to treat schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. So I support the ACA. I want to see it expanded and I want to go far beyond what the ACA provides today. On energy, uh, I have made it clear that we need to transition to renewable energy resources. We also must acknowledge that I drove here on a Dodge Grand Gar Caravan that burns gasoline. I want to be able to produce those energy resources here in this country for as long as we need them. I want to speed the transition as quickly as we possibly can. And so um, you're right to look at my voting record. You're also right to listen to the answers to the questions that you pose. And then the great thing at the end of the day is that you will make the decision about who our nominee will be and who your next president will be. And we will all honor that. So thanks for being here and thanks for asking the questions. Appreciate that. All right. This is our last question. Hi, Beto. Um, seven days into his presidency, Donald Trump uh, signed an executive order banning travelers from seven countries in, uh, coming to the, to the country. Um, so I know your stance on the travel ban, you're opposed to it. Uh, if elected president, would you pledge to uh, reverse the travel ban within the first seven days of your presidency? Thank you. Yes. Uh, th thank you for the question. And, and, and last thing. I, 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 I'm trying to draw the connection between the words that our president has used and the actions that some people feel free to take. I mentioned the mosque being burned to the ground, the rise in hate crimes all over this country and really over much of the Western world. We just lost 50 of our fellow human beings in New Zealand. Islamophobia, the hatred, the violence committed in its name is alive and well in this world. And we do not need a president who fosters it, who encourages it. We need somebody who understands that this country's genius is founded on the fact that we are a people from all over the world, from every tradition of faith, from every race. Um, who you love, who you pray to, how many generations you've been here, none of that matters as much as the fact that you're an American. And I really wanna make sure that we campaign in that way, that we serve in that way, and we treat one another in that way. Let's be good to each other. Thank you all for having me out here today. Very, very, very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you.
We've all got to do it, right? We all do it. 